as I'm recording, um, so this is the lesson on latent heat. Uh, as I said, it's about 30, 40 minutes of me talking. Uh, if you, if anybody who's online wants to stop and ask questions, please do. If, um, if not, please do make sure you watch this whole recording and, um, and then have a go at the Seneca task, which is on the same, um, on, on the same show, my homework page. So without any further ado, I'm going to talk you through a little bit about latent heat. So I'm going to switch to my desk camera so that I can doodle and uh, give you formulae. So the whole idea about latent heat that comes from the word latent. Now latent heat literally translates as hidden. Now the reason why that is, is if we were to take um, some ice and we were to measure it warming up in, uh, uh, warming up regularly. What we'd see if we started the ice say at minus 15 degrees Celsius, which is which is a cold freezer temperature, and if we were to warm it up at a constant rate, so we're ignoring heat losses a little bit here and heat gain in this case. Um, we're just really looking at the heat we're deliberately gaining. So we know the temperature would increase right up to the point where it gets to the melting point. Now, I'm not gonna draw this, this graph to scale, you'll see why. But when the, when the ice gets to melting point, what actually happens is it stops heating up. So its temperature stops uh, rising. And for a little while, it stays at zero. There's still thermal energy going into it because we've still got the same, um, um, we've still got the same uh, sort of rate of increase of thermal energy. But now that energy is being used to, uh, to produce, to overcome the bonds in the ice, to turn it into a liquid. As we, as we talked about before, when things change state, energy has to be used to break bonds between molecules. Now, up to a certain point, once all the ice has melted, then it will start to increase in temperature again. Now, as it increases in temperature, eventually, get to 100. eventually, we get to 100 degrees Celsius. And what happens again, the water won't increase temperature at all. And in fact, as water, it won't increase temperature. But if you then measure the steam coming off it, the steam will still be at 100 degrees Celsius until eventually you've turned all the water into steam, okay, into actual uh, water, uh, into full sort of steam. Now, the steam is not the stuff you see coming out the spout of a kettle. If we were to take a kettle, and we were to heat it, what you'd actually see, you'd see like the cloud. But well, that's actually, um, that's, that's actually water droplets. They've recondensed. So that's actually liquid water. But here, where you can't see anything, you would have steam, okay? Now, if we were to continue to heat that steam up, it could heat continue right, uh, increasing in temperature. But what's happening here is that the energy must be going into the system. It's still thermal energy, it's still being heated, but the temperature's not rising. So energy is needed to change state. And we, and we established that in uh, last week. So what I wanted to do was really give you a, a few examples here, but also to give you a bit of the sort of the mathematical side of things. <clears throat> it stands to reason that if you have this level of water at a particular time, as as the water evaporates, that water level is going to is going to is going to decrease. In other words, a certain mass of water will have evap will, will have uh, vaporized. So we know that to change state, we need to add energy. And that energy that's being supplied, the heat's been supplying energy at a constant rate. So the more energy supplied, the higher the mass of, uh, of the substance that changes state. So that's where we start. Now we know it's usually thermal energy, okay? In fact, in nearly all cases you'll come across it'll be thermal energy. It's gonna be proportional to the mass that changes state.
Okay. So if that energy supplied is proportional to the mass that changes state, that means the energy is equal to some constant multiplied by the mass that changes state. And that constant is actually we call it the specific latent heat. Okay. And if we think about it, there are actually two types. We actually have the idea that the energy we supply is equal for turning the ice into water, the liquid the water. Heat of melting. That is the yeah, specific. Well, we, we, we say melting, but actually the word we use is fusion. So this would be the specific latent heat of fusion multiplied by the mass that the mass of ice that's been converted to water so what you could do to do to to, to measure that i'll show you in in, in a moment but uh, what you could do is basically you melt some ice you can measure the mass of the water um dripping off the ice and you could actually then work out uh, if you know the amount of energy you put in you could then work out the specific latent heat of fusion okay for turning from a um from water into steam or a gas, it's the specific latent heat of vaporization. Okay, it's the same formula, it's just these two numbers are different. Now, if we think about it, we've got to think about the units of L, the units of specific latent heat, and it's going to be the same for both these because these are both latent heat. So, the unit, well, we know that if we rearrange that latent heat, is going to be the energy per unit mass. So the units of specific latent heat are going to be the joules per kilogram. Okay, so we have a couple of very important formulae there. So what we need to do also is I need to give you a definition of both of these. Of, of, of these. And the best way to do this is to actually write the definition for fusion. So it's definition of what's called the specific latent heat of fusion. Now what I'm going to do, I'm just welcoming Arda into, uh, in, into this. Good morning, Arda. Uh, we, what we're doing, uh, we're just talking about latent heat. Um, wait, I just to warn you that I am recording this particular session. There's specific latent heat of fusion. We can also think about it about vaporization as well. So I'm going to put vaporization in brackets. The reason being is the two definitions are almost identical. So the specific latent heat. of fusion or vaporization vaporization is the energy required should be thermal energy remember is the energy required to melt or vaporize Oops. a unit mass of a, well, for melting, we melt a solid. For vaporization, we're vaporizing a liquid. So unit mass of a solid. Um, and the important bit is it's without changing its temperature. Okay, and that's the, that's the important part. So if you ask the work to, to say what the specific latent heat of fusion is, you would write that without the bits in brackets. If you were to describe what the specific latent heat of vaporization is, you would replace the bit before the brackets with what's in brackets, okay? The bit that's actually quite important is remembering it's without changing its temperature, okay? 
So then we can start to think a little bit about what that actually, what that actually means and, and uh, some of its implications and some of its applications in society. Well, because of the idea that we're, me that we're melting a small, amount, a small amount of a substance, we could work out the energy required to boil, as an example, as a simple example, we'd say how much energy is needed to boil away, in other words, vaporize, 0.5 kilograms of water. Now, that could be a particular exercise. Now, in this, you would be given the specific latent heat of vaporization of water, which, uh, if memory serves me right, is about 2.3 times 10 to the power of 6 joules per kilogram. So you'd work out the energy and you would work it out by, by multiplying the mass times the specific latent heat of, vap of vaporization. So that'd be 0 0.5 times this value. So that comes out to be uh, 1.15 times 10 to the power of six joules. Okay. Now there are lots of examples of this. The first one is where you would, is, is where you sweat. Now, you know that if you exercise, you know that you, you know that you sweat. So what would happen if you produced half a liter of sweat, you'd actually be taking 1.15 times 10 to the power of six joules of energy, of thermal energy away from your body. And that's why we sweat. We sweat so that the sweat can evaporate. And as it evaporates, it helps you to, it helps you to keep cool, okay? Otherwise, your body temperature would increase and you would end up um, you end up very very poorly because uh, all the enzymes in your in your body require a certain optimum temperature to work. So applications of this include things like sweating. Okay, your sweat evaporates. They include things like ice cooling your drinks okay if ice cools your drink you know that the, 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 that some of the energy taken out of the out of the warm drink will actually be used to melt the ice so the ice will still be at zero degrees celsius for a long time taking thermal energy out of out of the drink okay um there are lots and lots of of, of examples of that sort of thing that's to do with cooling Heating is a little bit more complex. When we're thinking about heating something, one of the classic examples of this is with a boiler. Um, a boiler is used to heat up water. Okay, it runs central heating system. So as you're, you know, as you're around Brook House, you see that there's a radiator on, on, the, on the wall of your room. That, that contains hot water, which is transferring thermal energy to the room. But how do they get that water hot? Well, the old boilers would just have a heater, okay, to, heat, to, to, to warm up the actual water. The newer type of boilers actually have, first of all, a thing called a condenser. The way the condenser works, the way the condenser works is that, is that when you burn gas, like uh, methane, it produces water vapor. Now, as it produces that water vapor, the water vapor hits the cold pipes. The pipes are cold because cold water goes in here so these pipes are cold so the water vapor condenses onto the pipes 
It's a bit like when you stayed um, at Brookhouse uh, during the winter. Sometimes during the winter, the windows uh, of, of some buildings will have, co they'll, they'll build up a layer of sort of water droplets on them, condensation. It's the same sort of idea. It's, it's the fact that there's vapour in, in, in the room. When you take um, a, a vapour of water, uh, particularly at a, at a temperature below boiling point, as soon as it, it when that air is cooled, it can't contain as much vapour. If it can't contain as much vapour, what happens is that it um, is is that it uh, condenses and turns and turns into water. Okay, so same thing happens on on these pipes. So we know that if we put thermal energy in to turn water into steam, we we turn the vapour turns to liquid. And that, if we're putting energy in to turn liquid into a vapour or into, in, into, into a gas, then the reverse happens when we turn the gas into a liquid. So th thermal energy is released. Okay. And to give you an idea, what actually happens then is that we then, we then end up with water, on, uh, water vapour on the outside of these pipes. The thermal energy is released, and that heats up the water. To give you an example, if, if say, 50 grams of steam is condensed per minute, now, a boiler will usually um, allow about two litres, you know, maybe two litres a minute, or three litres per, well, we'll say three litres per minute, allows three litres per minute to flow through it. So it heats up, to heat up three litres of water. We can actually calculate the temperature increase quite, quite easily. Because what we could do is we could talk about the energy being released. The energy released is the mass times specific latent heat of vaporization for water. The mass, uh, we'll say 50 grams, 0 0.05 times 2.23 times 10 to the power of 6. We can get an estimation. Well, that was 1.15 times 10 to the power of 5 joules. Okay. Pretty simple. That tells you how much energy goes into the water. It's the same energy is required to heat up the water. Now, have you been shown the formula for specific heat capacity? Hello, anyone there? Yeah. Have you been shown the formula for specific heat capacity? Well, well, I, I, I didn't get your answer. Are you familiar with that formula here? Hello. Hello. Yeah. Are you familiar yeah, with I'm, the formula? You see? Yeah, I'm formula? familiar with it. Right, so you you are familiar with that. I was just double checking, just in case I ended up, because um, I, I I'd have been happy to to sort of spend fifteen minutes talking about where that's from. But that's basically the energy required to heat up the water. So it's the energy gained from the steam becomes the energy to heat up the water. So if we think about it, the mass of the water is three litres. But we know mass is the density uh, times the volume. Okay, so the density of water is 1,000 kilograms per cubic metre or one kilogram per litre. Okay, so that's that's quite easy so that's going to be three if it's three liters it'll be three kilograms quite convenient so it's three kilograms of water multiplied by the specific heat capacity of water which is four thousand i think it's four thousand two hundred off the top of my head 
multiplied by delta T is equal to that energy. So we can work out the change in temperature. It's 1.15 times 10 to the power of 5 divided by 3 times 4,200, which my desk is getting cluttered. I've got to reach my calculator. It's getting hidden under piles of stuff already. So we can work that out. It's pretty simple. If that's the case, then it's uh, 1.1 times 10 to the power of 5 is 115. That's 1.1 times 10 to the power of 5 divided by 3. Try again. And then divided by 4,200 gives you a temperature change of about 9 Kelvin, or nine, you know, uh, roughly 9 Kelvin. Okay? Now, that doesn't look like a lot. It goes up by 9 degrees. But actually, that saves a lot of money. That's, that's basically free energy, which with the old design of boilers that didn't have the condenser, that would have been heat from the natural gas being burnt to actually heat up, um, to heat up uh, the water. So we're saving quite a lot of, we're saving a bit of money. So with, um, with condent what's called a condensing boiler, we can actually uh, create a temperature change of the water to preheat the water before it's heated by the gas. So we're using a little bit less gas. That's good to save money. It also saves the environment because when you burn methane, you produce, if you burn it very cleanly, you produce water vapor and carbon dioxide. Uh, of which we don't want to be producing too much carbon dioxide because it may lead to uh, climate change. So, as we're moving on, we could think about um, we could think about rates. Now, it's all very well and good being able to heat up water if you get a kettle and you heat up the the water at a particular uh, you know. Heat, heat up the water, you can work out the energy that goes in by the fact it's energy is power times time, and you can work out how, much, how, uh, how long it might take to uh, heat up a kilogram of water up to boiling point and how long it would take to boil away that kilogram of water. That's fairly trivial. Um, but often when you're heating something up like an electric shower or, or even a combination boiler, we're looking at the rate. So the power, remember, is equal to the energy transferred, I'm just going to write energy, divided by time. So for, um, for changing state, the power of a heater would be mass times specific latent heat divided by time. Now specific latent heat is a constant, it's a constant for a given material, you can look it up in K and Laby. So what we end up with is the idea is you can work out how much water is turned to steam uh, per second, or you can work out how much ice is turned into water per second. So that then gives you a useful formula because most electrical devices, uh, you, um, they, they have a constant sort of power rating, so you can work out the amount it changes state. Similarly, with specific heat capacity, it works out exactly the same. The power is gonna be MC times the change in temperature. So the power is going to be M, sorry, that's the energy, I do apologise. So the power is the MC times the change in temperature over time. Now, if you're not changing state, there's no change in mass. So the power is literally going to be MC times the rate of change of temperature with respect to time. So you could actually work it, work out how much. Um, how much what you know you know how quickly you can heat up water if you know the power being being delivered similarly with a with a flow with something like a boiler cold water's going in one end continuously and hot water's coming out the other end well if you have a particularly particular desired change in temperature then you can actually work out the amount of water that would flow through per second this is particularly useful with electric showers. You know, if you use an electric shower, you've got a choice really between having lots of pressure or having the water nice and hot. And this is the reason. If you put, if your water goes through the heater too quickly, that M over T is too big, for the same power of your uh, supply to your, your shower, then the change in temperature has got to be smaller, which means your shower is colder. 
So if you want, if you've got uh, water flowing through, um, if you've got water flowing through, uh, um, through, through your shower unit and it's too cold, you want less water flowing through per second. So, so the, more of the energy will heat up the water to a higher temperature, a small amount of water to a higher temperature. This also comes in handy when you're having breakfast at Brookhouse. You ever use the toaster in Brookhouse? Yes, sir. Yeah? Yeah, I have. Yes, you think about it, the toaster does exactly the same thing. If you've got, you've got, your toaster's like a conveyor belt. You've got that box. You put your toast on this end and the toast comes out this end. If you, part, if you have this conveyor belt turning the whole time, what happens is that the, that the toast goes from A to B in a particular time T. Okay. Now, if you think about it, the, the toaster is uses an electrical heating element to, to heat up your toast. And all it's really doing is it's heating up the bread. So if we think about it just as heating up bread, the bread goes in cold here, it comes out hot here as toast. What actually happens is it depends on how, on how fast this conveyor belt's moving. And that's because it, in the time it's taken to go from A to B, it's gonna have received a certain amount of energy. That energy that the toast will have received is power times time. So that means that if the toast goes through very, very quickly for the same amount of power, it will, um, it's change in temperature, it's gonna be small. And that's why when you try to make the toaster toast a bit more quickly, it doesn't cook the bread properly. It doesn't make the toast properly. Okay, so you have to have it going at a, at a certain pace. If you put it in going too slowly, obviously then you burn your toast because that increase in temperature is, is, is too big. So there are lots and lots of applications to this. Their specific capacity is all about applications really. To talk you through some of the experiments, some of the simplest experiments, let's imagine what to measure the specific latent heat of vaporization of ice. Well, what you do is you want to measure the amount of water that you vaporize. So what you do is you'd have your heater, and that would be connected to, um, to your power supply. You'd measure your current and voltage through it because that would then give you the power. Okay, and you'd take some ice that you would heat up with your heater. Okay, so we want to keep it at zero degrees Celsius. So you let the ice warm up to zero degrees Celsius and then you start and you switched on, you start heating. You could then measure, you then collect your water at the bottom in a beaker which you would have on top of a top pan balance. Okay. And you collect your water in here. You could measure the mass. So the way that you could then work out uh, the specific latency of, uh, of uh, fusion for water is you would just use the idea that E equals ML for uh, fusion, for, 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 yeah, for melting use the idea that that's equal to power times time, which is also power, electrical power is current times voltage. So we end up with IVT equals ML. So if you measure, so if you then want to work it out, now you could use a graph, but the simplest way is to measure the mass you've actually vaporized, uh, sorry, the mass you've actually melted here. So that would be the current times the voltage times the time taken divided by the mass. Okay, you could also measure the mass over time and you could then get a graph out. That's another story. Okay, and that would then give you the value. Sorry, sir, what will affect this water? Sorry? Well, what will affect this water for the heater? Well, what's happening is the heater is melting the ice. We've got ice here. Okay. That makes oh, okay. So it's melting. Yeah. This beaker starts out empty. As you melt mm -hmm. the ice, you're supplying thermal energy with this electric heater. As you melt the ice, you can measure the mass you've, had, you've melted using a top-hand balance. Mm. Okay? You oh, can do okay. It like that. 
or yeah. or you could measure the mass with respect to time so if we could actually take that formula you measure the mass mass equals um i v t over the specific latent heat of fusion so we could say if we separate that out you'll see why in a second times time you keep the current and voltage constant you end up with a straight line graph the gradient is that bit okay so you could do it graphically or you could do it by calculation what would be the problem with doing this really in in laboratory well doing the experiment yeah this would give you a certain amount of mass of, of ice melted but it's going to give you an inaccurate value because uh, yeah i'm thinking i'm thinking um some might be some some water might evaporate some water might evaporate it might well do something something more something actually when you think about it, it's pretty obvious what would happen to this ice if i just left it in the laboratory without heating it up would it stay what would, to work? what would happen to this ice if i left it in the laboratory just you know with, with, without heating it up with a heater it's good to melt eventually it's gonna melt so we're gonna yeah. end up with a value of mass that's too high so that means our gradient would actually be too high and we'd end up if we think about it if our mass is high our specific latent heat of fusion is going to be too low so we need to find a way to cancel that out so what you do is you actually run the same experiment next to it with exactly the same equipment still no heat. heater but this time the heater isn't connected Stand to up. anything so then you measure the, the same amount you're measuring the water the amount of water produced the mass of water produced you know it'll be a bit less because you're not actually you're not actually heating it up with your electric heater so it'll be a slightly different mass okay so what you've got to do to adjust it, so we know that LF would be too low. Whoops, LF would be too low. So what we want to do really is we would want to try and think about how we'd actually compensate for it. Well, we could measure the amount that would have melted anyway. So we end up with the idea that the energy supplied, which is current times voltage times time, on this first experiment here is equal to and it's going to be the mass multiplied by the mass that sorry subtract you subtract the mass that you would have that would have melted anyway in that time okay so again you could do it by calculation specific related to fusion now is going to be current times the voltage times the time taken divided by the difference between the amount of ice you melted with the heater switched on and the amount of ice you melted with the heater switched off and that would give you a more accurate value okay now if you're then doing that you could also do it graphically to look at it graphically we could actually uh, put this expression on the y-axis couldn't we so we could say m minus m primed is equal to um, I times V over the specific latency diffusion multiplied by the time. So we get our graph. And we'd end up with the gradient there being equal to that part of the expression. Okay. And you could then calculate if you know the current measure the current and voltage with your heated ice, you could then calculate your specific latency diffusion much more accurately. Okay so there's there are some there, there are some other problems here when we think about it for vaporization we talked about thermal energy from the lab going into the ice naturally for specific lady to vaporization you could take something like a kettle okay with a heating element in the bottom you take your mass of water And you could have a power meter 
to measure the power. So you could measure something like, so you could actually boil away the water, couldn't you? You could actually say, well, okay, if you want to measure the mass, measure the mass of the kettle and the water together on your, mass, on your, on your top pan balance, you'd know that the mass of water being evaporated would be the power of the kettle multiplied by the time divided by the specific latent heat of vaporization of the water, okay? And again, you could actually then measure the mass evaporated by measuring the mass, that mass would go down. So that delta M is equal to the mass at the start minus the mass measured every say 30 seconds or so. And you could measure it. But what now would give you what would create a big source of inaccuracy? If I wanted to um, measure specific latency to vaporization, either, you, either graphically or by a simple calculation, what would give me a problem with that? With this setup. In what way? I'm asking what to give you a problem with this setup. Yeah, so what would give me a problem with measuring this value, with, with actually calculating the specific latency to vaporization of water. So we take the water, imagine it's already at 100 degrees Celsius, okay? It's 100 degrees Celsius water there, okay? So it's ready to boil, it's boiling away. We measure the yeah. mass at the beginning, you measure the mass at the end, and that change in mass is power times time over specific latency to vaporization. Okay? Um, so what time I condense back into the container? Okay, some might condense back into the container. So what would I do to prevent that? Oh, then I'll open the lid. Yeah, you get rid of the lid, okay? So we get rid of the lid. Get rid of the lid so that the water does, so the vapor doesn't recondense back into the container, or less does. What else might, might be a problem? Not quite sure. Well, the water's at 100 degrees Celsius. What temperature is it in the lab? Oh, it's like 24. Yeah, about 20 degrees Celsius. So the lab temperature is 20 degrees Celsius. Okay. So why might that give us a problem? Heat to be lost to the environment. Right. So th th you'd have some thermal energy losses to the environment as a result, okay? Now, there are a couple of ways of, of getting around this. What's the, what's the most obvious way of, of, of stopping the heat from getting from the hot water to the, uh, to the air in the lab? An insulator? Yeah, you'd insulate it. So you would actually, therefore, instead, you'd improve your experiment by insulating it, okay? Obviously, I'd never expect you to draw a scruffy diagram quite, quite like this, but you get the idea. So you'd insulate it, okay? And uh, maybe the problem with also having no lid because you would lose some thermal energy out, out, out of the top, but if we insulate it on three sides, we at least minimize it. Well, another way to look at it is to say the energy supplied is equal to the mass of water being evaporated multiplied by the specific latent heat of vaporization of the water plus the energy lost to the surroundings. Now, what happens, because you've got a constant temperature difference between these two, we can actually start to do some playing around. Well, if, the, if we got the energy as power times time, the power is the mass times specific latency to vaporization divided by time plus the power loss. If this temperature difference between the inside and the outside is constant, that, in theory, should actually be a constant. Does that make sense? Yeah. So what you can do is you can actually think about how you go about measuring this. Well, if we if we try to if we if we try to sort of do a bit of a, a graph here, we know that we could we could measure the, sorry? Will it be the intercept? Well, not really, because power is a constant. The power being supplied by the kettle is constant. So what we need to do. These are our two variables. That's our dependent variable. 
and that's our independent variable. So what we need to do is, 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 have the, is have one of these as our Y factor. So I might as well put T over here because it makes a lot more sense. If I make T, if I rearrange it, so T is the subject, I multiply both sides by T and I divide both sides by the power, then end up with MLV over T plus the power loss over T, oops, get rid of the T there, multiplied by T. What's the problem with that? What should be the y-intercept? It should be a constant, but here we've got a variable in there. So it doesn't work. Yeah. yeah. So all we can really, so we can't really do any kind of fudge factors, any, any sort of clever maths really, to get a graph that will give us an accurate value. The only thing we really can do is prevent those heat losses. But what we can, what we can also do is we can actually compensate. We can actually compensate for it if you measure the power loss. If you can measure it, we measure the power loss um, uh, beforehand. Okay, which is actually what I did. What I did when I designed the experiment to do this um, for school use, which unfortunately you're not going to get to do because we're we're not physically in in a lab is I had a kettle with a given power rating, but I measured the actual power it delivered to the water uh, by heating up the water, knowing what specific heat capacity of water is, I measured the power actually delivered to the water, uh, particularly at higher temperatures, and then used that, and then used that as, my power, as my power supply, okay, as the power. Because once you say, once you have P minus the power loss is equal to M LV over T, okay. Then we can start to rearrange to make, say, M the subject. M's our independent variable. It's going to be P minus the power loss. We've got to multiply both sides by T, divide both sides by LV, and then you can get your straight line graph. where your gradient is going to be power minus the power loss, sorry. Divided by the specific latent heat of vaporization of the water. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, you, all you really required in the actual exam to know about experiments to do this is is that is that you in the exam obviously you're aware that you're given um, you're given so you you're given some some key values and give, you're given maybe an example and you might have to think about things like heat whether heat's lost to the surroundings or in the case of where the substance is very cold the heat actually is actually gained from the surroundings okay. And that's, that's just really why I want to talk you through it. I also want to talk you through the practical aspect because it is part of the course. And if you're going on to do something like engineering, this might come in very handy. Okay? Yeah. Okay. So what I'll do is I'll end it there. Now, what I'm going to do to verify that you've learnt about this, if you go back to the work lesson... On scanner. Sorry? You should complete the work on Seneca. I think that I even know. That's it, it yeah. So what you need to do is go on to Seneca Learn, and you've, you've used Seneca Learn before, I know that. So go on to Seneca Learn, there are, there, there's an assignment comprised of two sort of mini modules that I'd like to complete. Now there are questions in that mini module and that will be my assessment as to whether or not you've, uh, you've understood this bit, okay? Yeah. Okay, That's... any questions? I had, I had questions. Mm-hmm. I had questions on the previous assignment. What do you mean, what do you mean by a root mean square of a particles? Root mean square. That's a good question. Okay. So going back to our gas laws, this is this I think it's actually a couple of assignments ago, but never mind. Um, the root mean square is if you take if you if you've got gas molecules, then we know that they're all moving around at random. Okay. Yeah. So if I want to work out 
their, their mean velocity. I'd have to sum the velocities and divide by the number of particles. But what you'd end up with is the mean velocity would be zero. So it doesn't actually tell you anything. So what we do instead is we look at the kinetic energy. The kinetic energy of each particle is proportional to its, its velocity at speed or velocity squared. doesn't matter whether you use speed or velocity here. I say speed. So that gives you the speed of a particular particle squared, tells you um, is proportional to, to kinetic energy, which is obviously also proportional to its absolute temperature. So to work out the absolute temperature, we know that we need to have this, this value of speed. We need some kind of average. So if we want to work out the absolute temperature for the kinetic energy for a body of gas, we know that it that we'd need the speed of each molecule, the speed of each particle, divided by the number of molecules. Okay? And that, and that, that way you could you could link the speed to the absolute temperature or the speed to the kinetic energy of the of, uh, of the of one of the average kinetic energy of one particle or one molecule. Okay. So what we have here is we have the speeds squared that's the mean so in other words is equal to the mean square speed okay so the mean square speed is that value and we express it as c squared with corner brackets either side of it now, if we think about it, if you've got um, if you've got if you've got um, very very slow moving molecules, they move much more quickly than this. But it's much easier if I use small numbers. If I've got molecules of psi over the speed of one, two, two, and three for my four particles, obviously we'd have a large number of much larger number of particles, and they'd be moving much faster than that. If I wanted to work out the root mean square, first of all, I work out the mean square which is going to be 1 plus 2 plus 2 plus 3, but each one has to be squared, divided by the four particles. So that would be 1 plus 4, one plus, four, four, plus, four, four plus, plus 9. Three. So that would be 18. Obviously, you'd use calculation calculator and do this much more quickly, but that would be hopefully about 4.5, okay? Yeah, yes, it is. That's 4.5, but it's still the square speed, still the mean square speed. So you repeat okay? So that's meter squared per second squared. So to get something akin to an average, we need to square root it. Oh, okay. Okay, so okay. I get it now. So okay. Alexa, what's the square root of 4.5? The square root of 4.5 is 2.1213. There you go, about 2.1 meters per second okay so that gives you the root mean square it's literally that's what's called rms it's literally the root the square root the mean square of the mean values squared okay so you take okay. the value you square it you calculate the mean of those squared values and then you square root it so think about it going in that direction Root mean squared means you square your values, you calculate the mean of those squared values, and then square root it. And that's what the RMS, or root mean square speed, is. Okay? Okay. And I also had one last complaint. Yeah. So, at where, where, where I am, I don't have graph paper. And you right. keep complaining about me not doing graph work. So, okay. I would say, actually, is it okay that next time, I just, like, take two points on the table to you find the do. A. Yes, from there. I could forgive you doing that, but you need. But do you have access to a printer at home? No, there's no printer here. That's that, that. That's my problem. Have your parents received the email from me about about your exams? Yeah. Right. You are going to need to see if you can get hold of graph paper. Now, on the instructions to your parents about about setting up the exams, uh, setting up an yeah. exam space, I've actually given you a sheet where you could just print that out 
So if you can, if you can find something, obviously you've got you've got a bit of time. So if you can would, find, would the exams be printed out? Sorry, I exams will be printed. Will be printed out at home. Yeah, you print out the graph paper at home, and then you can print what it. About out. The, I mean, obviously, if you have ready people? access to a printer, you need to. You've obviously got a few weeks to find a way to find a printer. Um, there are a couple of ways of doing this. Uh, what you can do are all uh, at home. Are all the shops closed? I don't know if um, I'm in London. I'm not in Nigeria. You're in London, right? Yeah. So places like W. H. Smiths. I don't know if like um, like non-essential shops are open. Right. To be honest, because I I don't go outside much. Right. Might want to find out. Go, go on. Go on the web. Okay. If you're in London. You can go on Amazon and you can buy a, a little booklet of graph paper and it can be delivered to your door. Okay, but I will probably need a printer because I, I, from what you told me, I will need to print out my... If possible, yes, sticker. please. As I've okay. said, you can work on, on, on just a piece of paper, a piece of lined paper and take photos of that. So if you really can't print, you can go on Amazon and buy a pad of, um, of uh, graph paper or you can find out if if a neighbour's got a printer and, and see if they'll they'll print out a couple of sheets for you. So there there are ways around it. So, but you would advise me to buy a printer. Sorry, you would advise me to get a printer. I would say that I mean, um, I would say that in an ideal world, you'd be better off getting a printer um, personally because it just makes doing the exams a bit easier. I thought I think and a bit more normal. Um, yeah. But if you, if you can't, there are ways around it. Okay. Okay? Okay, so I'll, I'll just talk to my friends. Okay. Them. No problem. I mean, let's say, if a, a print is a tall order, so you can always go on Amazon and buy some graph paper, or you can see if your station is open, like WH Smith or someone like that, if you're in the UK, um, and you can go and buy it. Uh, there, there, there are lots of ways around it. It, at, a, at an absolute push, if you really can't do it, you can always use Excel, and I'll forgive you using Excel, but that's really last resort. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. so when will be your uh, exam? Sorry? 15th? Yeah, exam. It's, it's beginning the 15th. You'll get, you'll get a personalised exam timetable on the 5th of June. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, take care of yourselves. Uh, have a go at the Seneca Learn task. And this afternoon, I'll do the walkthrough of the homework from uh, okay, yeah, and, last week. And I'm just saying, Mr. Gary, so I, would, I sent you an email concerning this previously, but I want to ask you again. Is there any way that the math lessons can be recorded from now on? That what, sorry? Is there any way that the math lessons can be recorded from now on? Uh, ask it up, email your math teacher. That's the best advice I, I, I can give you. Um, certainly, Absolutely. Mrs. Randon carry, uh, has a big bank of recorded bits of maths lessons. So if, you've, if you're doing... But, but she's not my teacher. That's my problem. Yeah, but she, but, but she may have some stuff that, that's useful for you. Okay? Okay, okay but Mrs. Randon can always, can, can always help you. But ask your maths teacher if they, if, if they wouldn't mind hitting record on the Zoom meeting. Thank you. So, yep. uh, I... I I did I did retake exam uh, for middle term. Yeah. Oh. So have you received Why? Have you received the email from me about uh, applying from. for your exams? I sent it. A couple uh, of yeah. Days. Right. So if you yeah. go, have you gone on that have you gone on that website to book your exams? Yes. So you book the ones um, you take as a resit. Or oh, on your on your email. There's a link. On the email, there, there, there's that link. You said you've gone on that link? Uh, I, I got like, uh, how will we exam and where do you want to make exam? Something like that. It was like something like that. So I'm not sure. I'm not I sure didn't get the result. How'd you get your results? I've sent you your results. Uh, I got, I got a normal exam, but I, did, I can't.